Well, folks, it's Jerry Adams and Shaw, and uh, I'm doing a virtual podcast with County Mayo TD Rose Conway Welch, and I actually got in touch with Rose to commiserate with her about the <laughs> All Ireland uh, game, which I enjoyed immensely until the the last, I suppose, third of the uh, game, and I was rooting for. Mayo, even though I'm a great fan of Dublin football, or or something to be admired. Anyway, uh, Rose You're, didn't really want to talk about football for understandable reasons. No, but, I do, I do, Jerry. Of course, but, I want to talk about football. I like the way there that you're uh, you're trying to straddle two sides of the fence. My God, it's been sixty nine years, seventy years next year since we won well, in All Ireland. So we are we're we're, we're hopeful. Well, I've told you many times, Rose, in the time that I've known you, that you're in the best team, the Sinn Féin team. That's your best chance of winning an All-Ireland. So uh, we're, we're going to have a yarn about uh, the, the anniversary, if that's the appropriate term, of the, the English king of the day giving royal assent, to use that awful phrase, to the... Government of Ireland Act, the Partition Act. So we should have a wee bit of a yarn about that if, if uh, that's appropriate. And we can talk about football as well. And mm-hmm. I, I should remind you that that, that Antrim are the All Ireland champions. Cogorgicus, Cogorgicus. And you know us in Mayo, we don't begrudge anybody else. We, uh, we got great joy out of the first half on Saturday. Not so much joy out of the second half, but there's always next year, and I think that's the thing you'd find about Mayo and uh, and and the West of Ireland. People in the West of Ireland, in general, we have a resilience. We have a resilience built up, and I suppose it's part of what we're going to talk about here today in terms of partition and the impact that it had uh, on, on the North, obviously. But obviously, it had a it had a profound impact on all of the island and that's why I'm glad of the opportunity here today to discuss this, the impact it had on the West as well in terms of immigration, of the whole economic divide, uh, you know, even going back to Cromwell when Cromwell said to Heller to Connacht, but we have built up a resilience so we're looking forward to next year for the football. Yeah and I'd be supporting you next year as well and I'm sure Thank you'll you. be there, I'm sure you'll Armada. be there. So, I mean, I'm sitting here in the city of Belfast and a lot has changed in this city in the last 40, 50 years. But if you if you reflect back one 100 years, you got to set all of this in the context of what preceded it. And without, without going too deeply back, you know, you can, you can jump back uh, to the Great Hunger. The Great Hunger was only 40 years before. It was in living memory. Mm-hmm. The population of the island had been halved. A million people had had died, uh, and it was just absolutely astounding that a group of men and women saw beyond all of that and had a vision for a real republic and went out in 1916 and proclaimed that republic. And then you know the 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 the, the whole context of what was called the, the Home Rule Act and Bill. All of all of that uh, is is the broad context of this, and of course the the Home Rule Bill was being opposed not not just by unionists in the North, but by unionists in the Conservative Party, and a, and a lot of the the rebellion, the open threat, the intimidation, the arming of unionists in the North, all originated in in the fancy rooms. In, in London and in Conservative Party offices and other other places. And if, if we fast forward then just to 100 years ago, to December uh, in, in 1920, I mean, 1920 was the, the, the huge big year of the Black and Tan War. It, it, just, 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 just to quote some of the dates, there are too many for me to recall, but just, just, just to quote, In in March of that year, Thomas McCartan, the mayor of Cork, was shot dead by uh, RIC, officers led by uh, a man from Lisbon. In the same month that Black and Tans arrived in, uh, 
in the month of May, the, 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 the dock workers refused to handle British war material. They were joined by the real uh, way, way workers who refused to transport British troops around the place. In June, soldiers of the Connacht Rangers in India mutinied over conditions in Ireland, and 14 of them were sentenced to death. Here in Belfast, sectarian tensions saw the expulsion of thousands of, of, of Catholic workers. Uh, in, in, in the same month, 40 people died here in, in, in Belfast City. Uh, Terence McSweeney was transported to Brixton Prison and commenced a hunger strike. And then if you fast forward into October, Terence McSweeney dies on hunger strike. The next month, Kevin Barry is executed, is hanged. And then at the end of that month, Bloody Sunday in Dublin, left 31 people dead. And then a week later, Kilmichael, where Tom Barry led the volunteers into mm. the biggest ambush of, of that uh, period. And then Cork City is uh, burned down by the Black and Tans. And then, uh, 13 days later, the Government of Ireland Act receives royal assent and becomes law. That's the Partition mm -hmm. Act. Partition is established on the island of Ireland in British law. Mm -hmm. And I think, Jerry, that's, uh, that's something that people often forget, or people in the South, um, as maybe are not aware of, just the the brutal uh, persecution against Catholics that saw hundreds of Catholics killed and thousands evicted from their homes and evicted from their jobs and all that. And I suppose the centenary, it's very understandable how um, people impacting people from across the island would find it so difficult to celebrate the centenary. That doesn't mean or the, or the, to celebrate partition. Um, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I think it's important to set that in the, the context of who suffered as a result of it. And many, many people suffered. And, and then the legacy that, la that, left, um, that la left behind it kind of coming through the, the decades, uh, right up until the, the present time. Um, just the impact that it had on people's lives and people's livelihood. So people who are left without homes and left without jobs and discriminated against and the second class citizenship that uh, that resulted uh, that resulted from partition. Um, so while we might commemorate it and remember it, and I think it's important to do that, but to set it in context and certainly to learn from it and to learn the, the severe impact that it had. Well, that's the important thing is to learn from it. I, I do think that we need to go over the history because that history isn't taught in, in, in mm. most of our main uh, educational institutions. Uh, what it was all about was the denial of self-determination mm. for the people of the island of Ireland. Yeah. What it's all about mm. today and this day mm. is the continued denial of self-determination of the people of the mm. end of Ireland, our, our right to self-govern ourselves. You know, the, mm. the, the English government, the British government, never had any right to be in Ireland, and even today has no right to be in Ireland. And thankfully, there's now a peaceful way of ending uh, British rule. Mm. So we have to learn the lessons of partition, and that's, that's as much for people in the South. I mean, partition set up to, to States, one was called Southern Ireland, one was called Northern Ireland. Mm. And the, the powers that those states were given was very, very, very limited. Now, of course, in the years since then, the, the South has managed to claim more powers and so on, and that's to be uh, applauded. But in the beginning, in the beginning, it was a very paltry uh, system that was put in, in, in place and and what happened was almost immediately both governments the one in the south started to prosecute a minority in the south and that mm. was the republican arguably the republicans may have been 
in the majority and general terms of, of, of activism, but just in terms of the, the, the draconian acts that were brought in, the execution of Republicans mm. and the expulsion of Republicans. And of course, in a wider way, in the North, there was prosecution of what mm. was a, a minority. Generally speaking, it was against Catholics because Catholics were deemed to be disloyal. So, so both states and both states, uh, it, it was a new way for the British to govern us. It, it was mm. a new colony in the, in the, the South. Mm. And I mean, I can see that that has changed in mm. the years since then. And, mm. and here in the North, it moved very quickly into be, being apartheid system, as you have described mm. it, because the only way to maintain power for the unionist regime was to mm. deny other citizens very, very basic, very, very mm. modest, you know, the right to a home, the right to a vote, mm. uh, you know, the, 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 the police powers, I mean, both, mm. both, both states for their existence have been under uh, permanent uh, emergency so-called legislation. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't a pretty picture and that, that's mm -hmm. without getting mm -hmm. into the openness of sectarianism mm -hmm. and the deep divisions which mm -hmm. still remain to this day. And that's the challenge for us, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I describe this uh, as being, you know, about self-determination for the people of the island of Ireland. When, when we came to the 1980s, I'm fast forwarding, and I went to my first discussions with uh, John Hume, that would have been about 1986. The first thing I put to him was this broad argument for self-determination and the need to get rid of the Government of Ireland Act. Mm -hmm. and, and the following year, Sinn Féin, published scenario for peace. Now, remember, this was in the middle of the war. It was just a few short years from the hunger strikes. Things were very, very polarized. The, the Irish and British establishment were working in complete collaboration to, to repress Republican and nationalist sentiment across the island of Ireland. So our focus was very, very clearly on getting rid of this instrument of partition, getting rid of this interference and in our right to self-government and getting rid of and getting John Hume's support for mm. the argument to repeal the Government of Ireland Act. Yeah, and I think that, you see, that is so significant. And I suppose that paves the way for us in terms of, say, I, I'm on the, the Good Friday Agreement to rock this committee, and we're looking at the outstanding elements of the Good Friday Agreement that haven't yet been implemented. And the fact that that was addressed within, that the Government of Ireland Act was addressed within the Good Friday Agreement is hugely significant because that enables us to do that. Now, you can look at, at, at governments, and I think both governments have failed in terms of the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement Committee, there were, in, in terms of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, the, things were left, I suppose it was, when after the Good Friday Agreement, things were, there was kind of almost like this has been done now without working through the implementation. And that really is the challenge for us now. And I think what's brought it to the fore is the fact that we've had the two unprecedented um, incidents, if you like global incidents of, of COVID and then of the impact of Brexit as well, that has brought all that to the forefront of people's minds to see what do we need to do? Where are we now? And it speaks to the, um, it was the failure of partition and uh, the consequence of partition in that we haven't been in charge of our own destiny. And I think people, regardless of what their constitutional preference, preference might be right now, are really questioning, you know, are my best interests served by Westminster? Indeed, are they, are they, served, are, are they best served by Dublin? But are they, are they best served by Westminster? And the answer is no. When you look across the, the, the agricultural sector, in terms of farmers, in terms of business, and in terms of so many other things that impact on people's lives, the people realize that we're only just an add-on. So for somebody like me who lived in London for a long time, you could see that for years, that 
you know, the north of, of Ireland was so far down uh, the list in terms of, of priorities for the British government or Westminster. Yes, it was there, but provided everything was, um, you know, it wasn't bothering them, then it, 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 um, it didn't come to the forefront of what needed to be done. And what needed to be done in terms of them being guarantors uh, of the Good Friday Agreement. And I think that has come to the fore, and I very much welcome that it's come to the fore uh, in recent months and in the last uh, few years as well, in terms of what we need to do. Well, you see, one of the things we have to reflect upon is the reality that there are two states in the island and that there has been a hundred years of partition and out of that arises partitionism. And while there is no great consent in terms of acceptance or respect or uh, I suppose love for the northern state by those of us who live here, we have agreed and this principle carries through to the new Ireland that we have to get the consent of the people north and south and a referendum was set out in the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. Now there is an admiration, a love among some elements of the ruling class and particularly the political elites in the south for the southern state. And there, there is a resistance uh, to the notion of, of, of a new agreed shared Ireland because the issues that you have talked about, whether it affects farmers, people in the rural west of Ireland, workers, women, all of those people who people for example who can't get home for christmas i mean why do they need to get home for christmas that's because they couldn't live in the place because they couldn't get the jobs and they couldn't have the opportunities in their mm -hmm. in their own place so you you gotta try and think 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 your way into all of this i want to pop back just for one second to the good friday agreement negotiations i outlined her my first meeting with john hume he raised his government of ireland act mm -hmm. We also raised it in terms of the Irish government, that that should be their responsibility. And we raised it in the Good Friday Agreement negotiations. We couldn't get the Irish government on board. The Irish government didn't want to touch it. Eventually, in fairness to Humberto O'Hearn, who was the Taoiseach, did concede because we would we've made such an issue of it. This is something that needed to be done. And it was only when we tackled Tony Blair directly and personally on this issue that we got the red of the government of Ireland. And I think that's one of the singular achievements of Sinn Féin's negotiating team. So what, what we now have is not the union as it was under the government of Ireland, of absolute, unconditional interference in Irish affairs. Now it's conditional. Now mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of semi-detached. Now the British government uh, is supposed to, is obliged to leave if a majority of people say that's mm -hmm. what they want. And mm -hmm. in there lies a huge role for the Irish government. And you're right to stress the outworkings of Brexit, the pandemic, e even as we speak, you know, the mm -hmm. stupidity of the DUP refusing to accept mm -hmm. the science, refusing to accept the health advice, going against their partners and the power sharing uh, government. All, all, of, all of that is part of the failure of unionism over the last hundred mm. uh, years. But the challenge for us, you see, is to persuade them and to persuade those people who have been wakened by the, the need for an all island approach. See, before you even get to the constitutional issue, mm. you know, mm. we, we have an all island animal health strategy. We don't have an all island human health strategy. Yeah. So, so people who might be just thinking about that as we approach mm. Christmas, you know, we need to persuade them that all island is the way to go. That, mm. Without even going near the constitutional mm. question, just, just to have that type of mm. deeply ingrained mm. single island approach. And the Irish government should be leading the way on that, not, not just on health, although that's obviously mm. a huge issue at this time with the pandemic, but on all matters that there can be deep drilled down, mm. uh, it, it just doesn't make sense for, for two parts of a small island mm. to be facing away from each other and competing with each other. And of course, Brexit 
has thrown all of this into stark relief. Will there be a deal? Will there not be a deal? Whatever is the outcome of the negotiations, it's not mm -hmm. going to be good for the people of the island of Ireland. And we need to get ways to that, and the government needs to lead mm -hmm. the way on that also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you no, know, I think you're exactly right. But I think there we, we have to acknowledge as well that there's a lot of really good work happening. There's a lot of really good work happening in communities in terms of cross-community stuff that's been done and the north and south stuff that's been done. Even if we look at, at education and things like that, I think there's a real opportunity here. We have the for the first time ever the the, the new uh, third level uh, department uh, further in higher education set up here. Now it's awful important we have a, an all island approach to education and third level education. We have in, in, in the north, we have almost, I think it's a third of people who go to Britain to do their third level education and they don't come back. And they're the people who contribute to the economy and all of that. So we need to make it in a way that, so for a mother in the Shankill Road with uh, boys the same age as my own boys, that they would consider going to Cork or going to Limerick or going to Dublin to university and vice versa that we do that because we have a wonderful academic talent across the island. I think that we're not maximizing and I suppose in everything, whether it be health or, um, or tourism or whatever, we have some great minds on the island of Ireland. And that's why partition never made sense to me is why we wouldn't have the combination of this to, um, to increase the prosperity for everybody and to address the, the inequalities that were there. And as we said, many of the inequalities that were bought out, bought, bought, uh, bought by uh, partition. So I believe that there's a time now that we can certainly do that. So while there are really good things happening, there's a huge responsibility on the Irish government, the Irish government that's here now, and of course the Irish governments that will be here in the future, and they have to make up for the neglect of that. Now, I very much welcome the shared island unit that was set up in the Department of Antishuk, but that will only work if it is, um, serious about looking at Irish unity and unifying the island. And that's why I suppose I was so disappointed when I went through that, um, that Irish, it, it, it's almost like, I think the government have left uh, the grassroots of their parties behind, uh, or not left them behind, but I think it, you could say that the grassroots have left them behind as well, in that the grassroots of Fianna Fáil, I think in particular, recognise that and they, they, they recognise that Irish unity is within grasp and that it's really important. And it is really important to them. Even in, in, in Mayo here in their own community, Irish unity is very important. But their government need to put a strategic plan together to advance Irish unity and not shy away from it. We should never as Republicans shy away from the fact that we want a united Ireland. Yes, certainly respect uh, others who have a different point of view to us, but we need to have an all island approach to the key issues, you know, the health, the economy, agriculture and environment and education, as I said, but there needs to be a framework set out for that. And I think one of the ways that we could do that would be to say for establish a, a joint rock this um, committee on Irish unity so that we can have the discussions and the conversations and that we can plan plan properly for the referendum on Irish unity, as you said, was provided for in the Good Friday Agreement, that people are able to have their say on that. And I think one of the keys to it could be in, in framing that conversation with everybody would be to convene an all-island representative uh, citizens uh, assembly or an appropriate um, forum to discuss that, to hear everybody's piece on it, because we're we're, we're better, better to, together on that. But we have to initiate the process because the process has already been initiated in, we're coming up to Christmas time, in households and in communities across the country. And the government have a responsibility there. And I think they need to step up to that. Well, I mean, first of all, Michal Martin and Taoiseach is not a United Irelander. Let's start from that uh, position. And he's quite clear uh, about that. And, and whatever merit there is in his Shard Island uh, unit, it, it will only be successful if we get him to focus in planning for the future, as you have outlined. 
And, you know, everybody plans for the future. Anybody with any sense mm. plans for the future. And we, we, we have a huge job of work to do in terms of persuading enough people who would be traditionally unionist uh, to vote for unity as opposed to the union. And there is a, a constitutional imperative. And if you look at any of the big set piece events of the last 40 years, like the the, the Hall Ireland Forum, you know, there's a constitutional imperative on an Irish government to pursue Irish unity. It's in the constitution, it's their obligation yeah, yeah. To, to do that. It's, it's the stated primary aim of all the Dublin based uh, parties. So, so let's be clear about this. So there's a constitutional obligation on an Irish government to pursue, to plan, to promote Irish unity. It's also the stated primary aim of all the uh, Dublin-based uh, parties. So what are we asking them to do? We're asking them to fulfill their own constitutional obligation and their own stated party policy. And I also look at all of the different uh, forum and other big conferences that were organized, like the, the Dublin Forum and all of that, all of them came down uh, up with the same imperative, plan for the mm -hmm. future, plan for uh, mm -hmm. unity. And we have a big job of work to persuade uh, people in the North that that's the way to go forward, those who would perhaps support the union or maybe have questions over the union because of Brexit or because of the pandemic or because of the change in demographics, uh, because they're all on, we're all on a voyage, we're all on a, a journey together. We, we have mm -hmm. to persuade them. And we'd only do that if the Irish mm -hmm. government becomes a persuader. So what Michael mm -hmm. Martin has to do is mm -hmm. to reassure, and we have to do the same thing as, as mm -hmm. Sinn Féin, to reassure those folks in the north, northern Protestants, if I can use that term, that their future is secure, that their rights will be protected, that they will have a place guaranteed in the mm. New Ireland, and, and that, that the, 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 the essence of self-determination, of self-government, is that they're part of it, that, mm. that they determine the future along with the rest of us of, of the way that we want to go and you know there are huge opportunities at, at this time mm. at, an Irish, at, an Irish mm. uh, solution to all of this mm. is very much an option at the moment but Irish unity is not inevitable it will only happen if we work on it it will only happen if we argue if we debate if we discuss if we produce uh, mm. interesting practical solutions I mean if, if, if someone says we can't afford it well, then let's mm. prove, as we have with mm. the economic benefits of Irish mm. unity paper that we released, let, let's prove that we not only can mm. afford it, but it will be a more prosperous place if it's mm. a joined up single island economy. Mm. If, if I, there's a problem over I, the health services, let's prove that we can bring in mm. an All-Ireland mm. National Health Service mm. and any other issue that people may have around rights mm. and obligations. Mm. And I'm just finishing this, Rose. See, the Irish government will only go as far uh, that's an Irish government without Sinn Féin. And remember, Sinn Féin is the largest party in the island at this moment, and the future of Sinn Féin is intrinsically linked to the future of the people of this uh, island. But at the moment, an Irish government will only go as far as popular opinion demands that mm -hmm. it goes. It, it, would have been, it would have been satisfied with the Downing Street Declaration. The Good Friday Agreement would never have happened if we hadn't have stuck to our... Uh, Position. And then when they got the Good Friday Agreement done, they walked away, more or less. They were content that they, they described that as a settlement. It was never a settlement. It, it was a huge uh, achievement, a very, very important achievement, a peaceful way to plan the future. And that's the opportunity that we have in this year as we, as we approach the end of 2020. Yeah, I think you're right, Sherry, and I think what's important that people recognise they can have whatever identity they feel comfortable with on the island. So if somebody identifies as British and that they're comfortable with that identify, that's okay too. There's room for everybody. I think in terms of the economy, which obviously 
to shut down the conversation is often like, well, you know, we couldn't afford it. We just couldn't afford Irish unity. And that's why I want to commend in particular, I suppose, Pierce Doherty for the paper um, that he has done on Irish unity and putting to, to bed in challenge and the whole subvention thing, even so between 10 and 13 billion is often used. But when we really look at that and we examine it in terms of taking out the um, um, costs like the pension costs, which are obviously attached entitlements, people build up over time, and that we see that the subvention is something like two and a half uh, billion. But that also doesn't take um, cognizance of the, um, the whole opportunities cost, the opportunities that will be created uh, by Irish unity and by having an all island approach to so many, uh, so many things in terms of jobs and industry and well and immigration and all of those things and I really would like to 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 welcome others and I know several other economists as well have done papers on it but to encourage others to write papers uh, on it and to on the all-island economy and on other matters in relation to it I think it's important that everybody's voice is heard as we head into a referendum uh, on Irish unity and let's come up for the best and it talks back to originally what you said in terms of being in charge of our own destination. Let's be in charge of our own destination. Let's be in charge of the shape that we want our island to be uh, in the years and the generations uh, to come. And that's what I think is very exciting about all this. And of course, it's not only people living on the island here, because I lived out of, um, I lived in Britain myself for, for, for a lot of years. But it's about having all of those voices heard. And I think it's crucial to hear what the Irish in Britain and also the British as well, but in America and Australia and Canada and many other um, areas that, that Irish people have been forced to immigrate, to immigrate to. Their voices are crucial at this particular time and their activism is crucial as well in terms of where we need to go uh, and how we need to prepare for a referendum on Irish unity. I think that's very true and the diaspora, or at least a section of the diaspora, have played a historic role mm. in the search and the struggle for justice and peace and unity on this, mm. this island and you're 100% right in commending them and in appealing for them to continue that work and to focus on that work. But let me say this, it's also work for the people of Mayo. Yes. It's work for the people of Antrim. Mm. It's, it's work for the Sinn Féin activists. It's work for us to do with other United Irelanders. This is not Sinn Féin's uh, possession. This is not our pet issue. This, this belongs to everyone. And uh, there are United Irelanders in every political party and none. And mm. there are people out there in the sporting sector, in the community sector, in the artistic sector, in academia, people, just ordinary folks, ordinary citizens who aspire to the type of Ireland that we want to see. I mean, why, why did Sinn Féin do so well in the last uh, election? Because the people caught on that change is necessary. And we had been, we had been preaching that gospel for a very long time, and the two of them changed. Sinn Féin's message of change, of a united Ireland, of a new Ireland, of a shared Ireland, of a decent Ireland, of fairness for ordinary working people and for those citizens who have disabilities and those who are disadvantaged. So all of those people have a stake in the Ireland of the future. And you, you'll mm -hmm. see, I, I very proudly have a portrait of, of Bobby Sands here mm -hmm. in uh, my little study. And Bobby comes from that tradition, like James Connolly, who, who saw Irish freedom and the struggle for unity and the struggle for independence as the reconquest of Ireland by the Irish people. And Bobby famously said, it's when the people of Ireland have the desire for freedom in their hearts, then we'll see the rising of the moon. So it's our responsibility to create that momentum, to build the mass movement, to make it unstoppable, to popularize it in Britain, to make it a democratic demand coming out of Britain, to work with our unionist neighbors and persuade them, but also to get an Irish government 
to do what Irish governments have neglected to do since partition. That is to create the momentum, to bring about, to plan for the future, to secure a referendum in Irish unity as we won in the Good Friday Agreement negotiations, and then to win that referendum and to create the type of Ireland that the people of Mayo, the people of Antrim mm -hmm. and everywhere else deserve. Mm -hmm. So good luck to you, Rose, and thanks for doing Thank this you. chat with me. And uh, this is this is nearly the end of uh, 2020. So here's looking forward to 2021. Absolutely. See you in part next September. <laughs> no doubt you will. <laughs> Karma got slung the pole. Slung mayo abu. Slung the.